Copeland? Here. McCain? Here. Wirtz? Here. Hyen? Johnson? Here. Rust? Here. Hanfelder? Here. Trent? Here. This is time for public comment. Uh, anyone wishing to comment? Updates, uh, Dr. T? Absolutely, so thank you. Good to see everyone. A quick update on uh, budget health, and then I'll move into enrollment and then introduction of new team members. So as of uh, the report is of June 30th, uh, with revenues, with half of the 2020 levy recorded in fiscal year 21 at the fiscal year end, total tax revenue now exceed budget by almost 600,000. As an FYI, as of June 30, the college had received two payments from Madison and from Morgan County. We're still projecting the same government revenues as previous fiscal year. Our tuition and fee revenue is essentially finalized and comes in approximately $77,000 below budget. Other revenue increased this month by 33,000 and indirect cost transfers from grants and programs were recorded at approximately $167,000 in June. Our expenditures, as we've shared before, are good as, a final, um, as final purchases are, are beginning to be recorded for fiscal year 21. We remain well within budget and uh, still projecting revenues over expenses um, a little over $2 million. So. Uh, I think we're, you know, as we talked yesterday at the finance committee meeting, we are in really good shape. Um, there's still some reconciliation that needs to happen uh, with invoices, et cetera. But uh, I think we, we did a great job this last year and uh, look forward to even a better year this year. So any questions? So uh, I'll keep this one short as uh, Brett Reinert will, uh, I've asked him to kind of dig in a little bit to uh, some of the activities and other dynamics happening with enrollment, but uh, as of uh, this week, we are down just under 7% in total students, just under 5%, or I'm sorry, just a little over 5% on credit hours overall. And, and I don't know, Brett, if you could, when you get into your report later on, but the online credit hours and online credit and credit students are really where we're seeing significant increase but you know it's important to know what's being factored into those percentages um, and why they're so big. And we were looking at from this time over last year about 60% above where we were last year with credit students and online credit hours about 61% up. So um, you know I'll have Brett kind of dig in later on, but uh, that's where we're at at this point. And of course, still still a couple of weeks till the semester begins. So you know typically you know and I say typically. Um, you know, as the theory goes, students will, you know, kind of wind up and, and sort of be last to the gate to say, hey, you know, okay, it's time to enroll. So we're, I know Brett and his team are doing some great work to try to push that. So I'll let him do that when he, when he, when he has the opportunity. So any questions at this point? Okay, great. So introduction of new team members. Um, we, we have a number that I'll mention today. Uh, we had Maya Lawrence um, started on August 4th. She's our new Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusive Excellence. So I wanna welcome Maya to the team. I had a chance to meet with her earlier this week um, or last week and um, you know, looking forward to a really positive um, impact that she'll bring to the team. Dr. Michael uh, Sundblad, our Dean of Liberal Arts, Business and Information Technology started on August 2nd and uh, looking forward to his work as well. And I, I don't think I saw Maya in the crowd. Maya, where is she? No, okay, I know Michael, so my, you know, so welcome to the team, yep, good to see you. And then we have uh, four faculty that are starting, um, Juliet Jackson in music, Lisa Reed in nursing, Christina Wickenhauser in accounting, and Chrissy Wiley in dental. Um, and uh, then we also had uh, Terry Austin, counselor, and Ashley Ledster, who's our new instructional designer. So um, those are some two new team members. We welcome them to the Lewis and Clark family 
and look forward as cliche as this sounds of trailblazing forward together. So welcome to the team folks. Um, and so that concludes my initial update, sir. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the uh, omnibus agenda need a motion to approve all of the items in one motion unless any board member wishes to uh, pull back any one item. Any board members wishing to pull anything out of the omnibus? If not, need a motion to approve the entire list. Motion. Right. And Brenda, second. Discussion? I just have, I just have one question. I don't know if this is working. Um, on item O, gifts to receive, uh, will that uh, ultimately be kind of like routed through the uh, 501c3 Lewis and Clark Foundation? Or is, that, is that the way that usually works or not? Yeah, typically gifts will go through the foundation. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Call for the vote. Copeland? Yes. Wirtz? Yes. McCain? Yes. Hyen? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Rust? Yes. Hanfelder? Yes. Trent? Yes. Next action items. Need a motion for approval of grant or sponsored contract opportunities. I don't have any comments on that one. Uh, I think that's straightforward, but I do have a comment on B and C um, when you're ready. So. Need a motion to approve A. Brenda, second. Second. Any discussion? Call for a vote. Copeland? Yes. McCain? Yes. Wirtz? Yes. Hyen? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Rust? Yes. Hanfelder? Yes. Trent? Yes. The item B, organizational restructure, need a motion to, there, yeah. or, or so, we're no, not even going to. There, there isn't an app. We had that as a placeholder. <clears throat> so, uh, and I've informed the board of this uh, via email and the executive team. Uh, we do have a name that we're forwarding for the uh, executive director of college effectiveness and grant development, but uh, we still have to move through some HR processes. So we'll bring that name formally in uh, September, but uh, we're happy to say that the, that we have someone we're really happy with and look forward to moving ahead. So um, no, no action required, just an FYI. Okay. I know there were some questions Thank on you. that. We have that more as a placeholder. So um, okay. item C, yep. need a motion for authorization to use CARES funding for administrative oversight and management of data related to COVID-19. Need a motion to approve that? Motion. Right. Brenda, second. Any discussion? Dr. T, any? No, I, I'm absolutely, you know, no comments other than, uh, <clears throat> you know, our leadership team, extended leadership team. I uh, just want to, I guess this is a good point to thank them again. But, you know, obviously we didn't think we would be uh, where we're at today. We realize that now COVID is stretched over three fiscal years or three academic years. Um, and so these dollars, we're really looking at just having some authorization to utilize those dollars to help with some processes and um, just help us to uh, uh, continue to do a good job of managing what we need to manage to keep the campus safe and uh, help us keep focused on teaching and learning. So that's all. So thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I, yes, I have a question. Um, it says that we're, we're going to be able to respond with the hiring of individuals or contract work. And I'm, I'm wondering which we're going to do because I'm not sure that this is a good time to be hiring people, the way that, you know, additions to our staff. The, these would be temporary folks that would help with, you know, for example, contract, contact tracing, et cetera. So these would be temporary part-time positions that we would so, utilize care dollars for. So there's nothing permanent. We're not, it's, you know. So it's all just, Temporary, yeah. flexible. Yes, okay. exactly. And so just having, and we're not sure what that number is going to look like it, because this is such a dynamic process. So we're just asking for the authorization to be able to have the flexibility to be able to make those decisions as we move forward. So. Any other comments? If not, call for the vote. Copeland? Yes. Works? Yes. McCain? Yes. Hyen? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Rust? Yes. Hanfelder? Yes. Trent? Yes. Informational items, number five. 
there are any questions on any of those items as tradition, I'll, you know, some good detail on the respective pages there, but, uh, and we have members of the team that may be able to respond. I mean, on F, I can respond to say, I've, I'm sharing that with the community now. The uh, leadership team will meet on August 24th to begin our discussion on the Manny Jackson Center for Humanities and really looking at framing or thinking about what that vision is going forward and what uh, we may feel is in the best interest of the institution as we, as we bring a proposal sometime later this fall. Um, the other items, if you have questions, I, I, I may point to some team members in the audience, but hopefully those are all straightforward and um, self-explanatory. Thank you. I have a question on, uh, on item E, Youth Build Award. I would like to know what team and what team leader is responsible for that? Uh, Dr. Val Harris. Dr. Harris. She stand yeah. up, please. <laughs> Thank you, Val. Okay, nicely done. Any other comments about informational items or questions? If not, leadership reports. So we'll hear from uh, respective leaders around each of these areas, and we do not have an update for information technology other than we are going to be beginning uh, the search for a new director of college technology. And I believe Dr. Hill will pick up the athletic update as well. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Lane. Thank you. Hi there. Um, I have a very quick uh, report tonight about academic affairs. We um, are coming off of a summer that usually slows down a little bit, and we are full steam ahead right now getting ready for classes. I think the biggest news flash um, you heard earlier was welcoming Dr. Michael Sunblad to the team. Uh, he has been here, I think, a total of eight or nine days, and he's hit the ground running. He's going to be an excellent addition to our staff. So, Michael, thanks already for all the work that you're doing. Um, We've also had some other hires. I know last time we talked about farm tech and we're doing reference checks for the farm tech faculty member. And as you heard, we've hired music and dental. Um, another big news flash in um, academic affairs is the Higher Learning Commission approved um, competency-based education in welding. And um, I just thank the team who worked on that. They worked so hard, Dennis Kreeb, Sue Serwinski, um, Travis Jumper, Angela Weaver, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some folks, but um, as far as I know, based on my chief academic officer listserv, we're the first community college in the state of Illinois to be starting um, competency-based and that will roll out this fall. So in a couple of weeks, Travis will have his welding students do that. Melissa Bachelor is in the room and she is like not far behind Travis in terms of looking at early childhood. So we'll be working on that also. Um, Blunt Flex classrooms underway, Ron Wall working tirelessly with his staff to make sure we've got as many ready for fall. They give us a lot of flexibility with the fluctuating changes with COVID and we can really um, be flexible if students have to be quarantined, for example, or if we run into situations like that. In service week is next week. It's a very full week for faculty and staff. Lots of departmental meetings. We've got the Tuesday morning in service where some of our new staff are gonna present to the faculty. And then we're just getting ready um, for classes starting the following week. Well, we're also working really hard on a project to create majors for transfer students. I may have mentioned in the past that, you know, we've got our AA degree and our AS degree, and you can actually major in psychology and go to SIUE, but we've never had a mechanism in our system to mark students as those majors and then actually market those majors. So we have a team working on that and hope to have that ready by kind of mid fall semester. So any questions? All right, thank I, you. I, I do have a question yeah. on that. We, we uh, hired four new faculty. I'm, I'm thinking that by the sound of it, they were all just to replace uh, replace people, right? Yes, and people. there were several retirements that where we didn't replace faculty. Sure. Okay. So I yes. do have one other question. Sure. Um, 
as I was driving here, I saw on a, on a Holland truck, a 18 wheeler, it said, earn while you learn, or learn. And I don't know, I have no idea what that's all about. It may be totally inapplicable, but is, is that something that, I mean, they're gonna be learning how to drive a truck. Is that something that is a challenge for us or not? There, there are some truck driving um, schools that are marketing that way. I know Dr. Sarinsky is here, where did she go? There she is. Um, some of those are accelerated programs as well, and, and our truck driving folks are very concerned. We've got a great CDC pass rate, and they're concerned about that some of those shortened um, programs sacrifice safety. So Sue, what, what would you like to add? Thank you. Sure, thank you. There is a school just started in St. Louis that advertised four weeks, which is pretty short. It's a per hire, but four weeks is not much time. All right, uh, just a quick uh, campus operations update. Um, so obviously over the past few months, uh, our operations team along with leadership have really been focused on preparing for the start of the fall semester amidst a lot of uncertainty and ever-changing issues related to our area's COVID-19 metrics. Um, and I know Dr. Tresca has included you in a lot of communications, but our number one goal is really just to create the safest environment where teaching and learning is, is not uh, disrupted um, throughout the fall semester and beyond. So a, a number of layered strategies taking place. I'll just um, highlight a few things. We're working on a lot of signage on campus and constant communication with our students and our internal constituents as well. Um, that'll really outline uh, our reporting protocols, who to contact if you are positive or if you've been exposed. We're also updating our coronavirus uh, web page as well with current information. Um, Dr. Traska mentioned contact tracing. That's one area we're really focused on in addition to looking at hiring some additional contact tracers to support those efforts, which we unfortunately think might be needed uh, with the start of the fall semester. We're also working with IT to create a 24 seven text line for individuals to call in and, and self report, um, just kind of speeding up time, especially over um, evenings and weekends, uh, people looking for instructions on whether or not they should be coming to campus. Um, and then also, uh, we are also working with IT to create a secure way for individuals who uh, voluntarily, if they choose to, uh, to upload their vaccination information, as, as you know uh, from CDC and IDPH uh, protocols, if you are vaccinated and you are exposed on campus, of course, quarantining may not, uh, may not be something that you have to do. So that information would be available to our contact tracer and she would have that information readily available in terms of relaying that information back to a student or a team member who might report an issue. Um, we've got a number of, of employees as well of, as students working on just promoting vaccination options on campus. WLCA, um, our campus radio station is working on some PSAs. And I did want to mention uh, Dr. Sue Sarwinski has been very helpful in working with Madison County to help create a uh, vaccine clinic at the start of campus, September 8th and 29th, I believe. Um, once again, our nursing students will assist in that. 
um, and our student government association and student activities groups are going to help promote that as as an option for students who might be considering that. Um, just some other safety protocols and planning uh, that's underway. Our clinic manager is working to uh, learn more about how we could provide testing on campus for both symptomatic and asymptomatic uh, people. So more to come on that. Uh, we did receive the 60, uh, 60 plus air purifiers on campus. Those are currently being deployed, especially in our main campus complex and other air, other buildings on campus where, um, as we discussed, the HVAC systems don't pull enough outside air in. Um, so those are uh, being deployed across campus. And um, as Jill mentioned, you know, we're working with academic affairs on a daily basis just to try to address any concerns of faculty and students as we welcome them back into the classrooms. Uh, just a few other quick highlights. Bike MS is upon us. Um, we're hopeful that it's going to happen this year. Uh, we that is September 10th, 11th, and 12th here on campus. They have a plan. They have yes, as of yesterday, they have um, 860 riders who have signed up. So we're working with them on making sure that event can happen and working on contingent contingency plans just in case. Um, just wanted to share with you also that the transition of our food service to Bella Milano has taken place uh, effective August 1st. They've done a number of catered events on campus already. And um, they'll be opening up our cafes on campus starting next Monday uh, to welcome back our faculty. And then um, they'll be in a full-time capacity starting August, uh, August 23rd for, to welcome back our students. Uh, I did just want to note included in the omnibus agenda was the sale of the mobile unit. Uh, that online auction closed uh, with the winning bidder uh, bidding $102,501. Uh, 53 percent of those proceeds will have to go back to the granting agency which purchased that vehicle for us but we should realize approximately fifty five thousand uh, dollars once the sale of that is complete so um, our CDB projects are still progressing the main complex foundation repair project had one bidder that was within budget so that's going to CDB for approval most likely at the September board meeting and our fire alarm system replacement project has um, has three uh, engineering firms that they were actually going to uh, select today. I haven't heard back on that yet, but that is moving forward. I just wanted to point out in HR, we have 14 open and active searches taking place right now. Um, and I can't say enough about uh, the, the work of, of our HR director, Gabe Springer and Marsha Logan, who are really carrying the brunt of getting all of these search committees put together and all the information compiled for our search committees. And I can't thank the campus community enough for taking part in serving on these search committees. We're really excited about uh, some of the talent that we're seeing already um, as evidenced here tonight. And uh, we're, we're, uh, we've gone through a lot this summer more so than ever with the early retirement incentive and the reorganization efforts. So I just wanna highlight that. So any questions from the board? If a class is exposed to COVID-19, obviously. Are they proposed to go online for two weeks or is it a case-by-case -case basis, week by week? Yeah, and, and to that point earlier, that's another reason why we're, we're trying to create a, a secure mechanism for those students who are vaccinated. I mean, it's all gonna depend on the class, the makeup of the class, um, you know, the faculty member, whether that person is able to, but we are working. Um, Dr. Lane and I have been uh, meeting with a lot of staff throughout the week, talking about how we can create some more flexible options using BlendFlex and virtual uh, virtual synchronous learning in, in the uh, unfortunate instance that that may take place. And so those are so those are the things we are really going to have to dig into and work through. Um, but it, yeah, it is possible that depending on the length of the quarantine and the status of the students in those classrooms that that would have to happen. So, Thank you. Thanks, Sam. I just wanted to ask about the uh, our comment on the speed bumps. Good job. Oh. I've been across some speed bumps where it felt like they were dent, going to dent the rims and break the shocks. These are fine. Yeah, no, they're good. And, and they're even bike MS approved so far. So <laughs> thanks. Over to Mary. Please, thanks. Good evening. With the approval of tonight's personnel report, I'm happy to say that Cindy McCoy will be transitioning to the new role of Director of Payroll Budget and Operations in the Finance Office. Some of you have worked with Cindy in the past, and I'm excited to have her experience and her efforts in this position. This was the first of two positions that we brought to the board a few months ago, 
Um, the second position, a grant operations manager, is with our HR office currently to set up interviews with the candidates selected by its search committee. I'm hopeful that there will be a recommendation for hire at next month's meeting for this particular grant position as well. Since we last met, we've continued to close out items for fiscal year 21. Our last actual check run for fiscal year 21 will take place tomorrow. And when everything is posted, we will be determinedly focused on receivables, payables, deferred revenues, transfers, et cetera. Our external auditors are scheduled to arrive on Monday, the 16th, to begin their field work. Uh, based on um, past years, that field work could take anywhere from two weeks to four weeks, depending on um, the availability of their team as well as our work. Um, as to the, the following year, fiscal year 22, the budget that was approved last month has been loaded and is available for budget managers to view online. In late July, we dispersed the first round of CARES or HERF money for the summer semester. Now this is becoming you know, a regular um, process of late. Um, our initial round was to 188 students. Financial aids in the process of authorizing additional funds for disbursement later this month. And tuition for the fall semester is due today. As of approximately four o'clock today, 209 payments have been processed on today's date. This does not account for students who have paid before today, those who have financial aid covering their balances, or students who are on third-party payer arrangements. There's much effort from the entire campus going into the first step of having students ready financially for the upcoming semester. And last but not least, and Kevin, I think this is something you'll be particularly interested in. I was unexpectedly surprised yesterday afternoon with an email regarding our COVID-19 insurance claim. Uh, we have received confirmation that the losses sustained by Lewis Clark under the communicable disease endorsement exceeds the applicable sublimit of coverage under the program and as such, we're in line with other claims for payment subject to its per insured sublimit of 500,000 that I think we've mentioned before, and the program wide aggregate limit of $10 million. So what does this mean for Lewis and Clark? Approval is pending to issue an initial prorated partial payment of $54,878. I asked a few follow-up questions today, and this payment represents 9 million prorated across the board. They're holding back $1 million until the final settlement. If the initial amount represents 90% less our deductible, we'll be looking at a total settlement of about $72,000 with approximately 62,000 in actual proceeds. Um, we have a $10,000 deductible. So this will cover our costs with PIXIS, which is the consulting firm we use to help prepare a claim with about half left over to put towards losses. I am open to any questions that the board may have. And if there are none, this concludes my report. Thanks, Mary. Okay. Dr. Hill. Dr. Hill will also uh, talk a bit about uh, athletics as well. Thank you, everyone. So a few things I wanna talk about. One, um, a new counselor who's been mentioned already, um, Terry Austin, she's started seeing students. And the reason I mentioned that is because it's clear that COVID and quarantining and all those things have had caused stress on our students. And so, you know, I mentioned to this group at the last meeting that through the counseling center, we're looking at ways to expand programming and workshops and all those offerings. And the need for those things, we're starting to see evidence of it right away. And so um, I will likely be bringing more things to the boards to talk about related to mental health. I'm also part of the mental health expert panel on campus, but I just want the, um, the board to be aware and also people in the audience to hear that again, this is still, even though things are sort of up and down, it's continuing to be a hard time for our students in our community. So keep that in mind. And if you have ideas about ways that we can help deal with mental health um, on this campus, please let me know. 
the other things is that I've told you at the last meeting that again, student activities, we're looking to put that schedule together. We have a tentative schedule of student activities events for the semester. And we're hoping, you know, again, based on um, COVID rules and quarantining and, and capacity, you know, some events may have to be canceled, but we're looking at ways of doing things and bring some things back. Um, music events, you know, bingo, which is surprisingly popular. Um, movies, video games, talks, costume contests, lip sync contests, karaoke, things that students like to do and, and get together and, and, and have fun and um, kind of take their mind off things that are going on. The thing that brings me the most pride to announce today, and this is fresh off the presses, is I've talked to you about our Talent Search and Upward Bound programs, and um, we applied for a Talent Search grant earlier this year, and we got a word, I just had a text message earlier today from um, Crystal Robinson, our Director of Talent Search and Upward Bound, and we received a $1.6 million grant for um, Talent Search, which is a five-year grant. Um, worth about $352,000 per year for five years. And that grant will serve Alton, Jerseyville, Roxana, Southwestern, East Alton, and Wood River High School. And so, you know, I wish to publicly thank um, Crystal Robinson for her work, as well as Lynn Ingram on her work for getting that grant renewed. And it's something that we should be very proud of. Other things that I think the board um, was informed of is some sewing machines were donated to our College for Life program for the sewing class, uh, as well as a cash donation from the Lynn Solomon Foundation for $300 for a gardening class. So we're very, we're very grateful for those things to be given to us um, and look forward to um, having those sewing classes. And then, SGA, which has already started getting ideas, they're gonna begin meeting within the next few weeks. And they're already looking at ways to help students as well in terms of uh, mental health and ways to support students. Um, our SGA president, David Kroll, is looking at, would like to have a meeting with SGA presidents around the state in order to figure out what other schools are doing. Um, for students during this time. So I'm, I'm proud of the leadership that he's already shown to help um, his fellow students and also students around the entire state of Illinois. Can I go into the athletics report? Okay. It's August, so some of our athletes have returned already. Um, it's things already, things start buzzing right around August 1st. August 1st is when teams are three of our teams are allowed to start practicing. So already on campus, we have men's soccer, women's soccer, um, and women's volleyball. Those teams have already started practicing. Many of those students have already moved into Trailblazer Commons. And so, you know, the, the noise and the smells of our athletes has returned to the River Bend Arena. And um, it's, it's, we're glad to have them there. Uh, we've already put together schedules, we've already started we already actually canceled some games based on, you know, cost savings, based on travel concerns, based on, um, you know, COVID concerns. And so, you know, we're doing what we can to, to be safe. We do what we can to save funds. And I'm looking forward to having about as normal as a year as we can possibly have. I also uh, mentioned to you, uh, I think at the last meeting that our athletic trainer resigned for another position. We are, you know, still in the process of trying to fill that position. That's very important. Um, we've had a few scares that we've had to have the nurse involved in. And so it's very important for us to fill that athletic trainer position as soon as possible since we have teams actively um, practicing. Any questions about anything? Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Right. Good evening. A couple of quick updates from last month's meeting. Uh, when last we talked, 
Summerfest was still a future activity. Now it's a past activity. Happy to report that for the two and a half, three hours that we were uh, available in the commons, we got about 150 people through the door and generated about 200 credit hours of enrollment in that one evening. So that was a, we, we consider that a great success for a summer session, summer activity we've never done before. Um, also, uh, when a quick update on new student orientation, the revision process that we, that I mentioned last month continues. Our plans now are to teach out uh, the current version of new student orientation and begin the new revised and improved version uh, beginning in January of 2022. Um, we're lucky to have uh, Val Harris uh, has a grant that's uh, from the ICCB that is supporting some improvements to our CRM recruit piece. That's the software from Elucian that supports our recruiting team. And what it will allow us to do is to add and use and track those applicants from adult ed and high school partnership slash dual credit programs. We can't, we don't currently use them for those two populations, but we will be after the improvements are applied to the CRM recruit piece. Um, also wanted to mention too that August 2nd was the first day of walk-in service. That's, uh, we kind of transition how we schedule uh, in the enrollment center. So we allow walk-ins to, to, um, to take place. So all of that activity started August 2nd and uh, we started off very strong. We'll, uh, we'll wait, we're tabulating those numbers and waiting to see exactly what that foot traffic ends up being at the end of the month. Um, and then finally, just to follow up on Dr. Traska's comments uh, about the enrollment piece, obviously the reports that, that go out on a weekly basis are year over year. Um, so comparing that, as he mentioned before, we're down about 7% on students, uh, but about 5.5%, 5.6% to be exact, on credit hours. Um, to address that point where he mentioned about the online enrollment, it does look kind of odd when you look at it in that column, but it shows about a 60% increase in online enrollments. And we tracked that down today, um, and it really is linked to our switches in modality for instruction. So when we added... VCM and VCB, that's uh, virtual course meetings and virtual course blended. Um, we had to make decisions with ICCB on how to report those particular uh, new modes of instruction. And so the VCM uh, meetings, that's virtual class meetings, we aligned with our online uh, classes because they don't meet in person very similarly. One of them just happens to be virtual and one of them happens to be asynchronous and online completely. So. The reason that that's sitting at 60% today is because we're reporting those to ICCB as similar uh, instructional formats, VCM and traditional online courses. So that's kind of explains the bump. It's a little, we, I, this is one of those where, where the report was generating, we weren't entirely sure where those were coming, but we got that tracked down today. So other than that, we're, we're seeing very similar, we're seeing very similar activity to last year. We're waiting for information to start trickling in from our peer institutions across the state. Typically we have listservs that we sit on where people start comparing numbers. What are you seeing? What are you seeing? And we haven't seen any of that activity yet, but that should start up here in the next week or so. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I just said, uh, you do the, uh, the enrollment report, right? And you say it's, it's year over year. Um, let's say, for instance, it's as of August 10th, 2021. Mm -hmm. Is it compared to numbers as of August 10th, 2020, or? No, that's a really good question. It's the, it's the week before, so we're counting down. So this is, this is week minus two. We're two weeks from, from the start out. So we look back next year, last year at two weeks prior to the semester. So it's the same, roughly the same time period, as close as we can get. It's not, it's not built on the date, it's on the time period. So it's roughly the exactly same point in the semester, enrollment wise, absolutely. And anything else you could tell me about high school partnership, uh, you know, what the enrollment's like? Or it's, it, well, I would say it right now, this is, in this particular year, it's going to be almost impossible for us to predict what enrollments are like. Keep in mind that we do those high, those high school partnership enrollments the first two weeks of the semester. So we won't see the numbers until our semester is underway. So obviously this is the first semester where we will be charging a fee associated with that service. And so we have had uh, you know, good communication with our high school partners. We've had questions about the fee. We've had questions about what that does to enrollment. We've had questions about all any number of issues surrounding high school partnership. Right now, uh, we have no reason to believe that there will be a, a disruption or that this will be significantly different than past semesters. So you're 
your policies are pretty much stable at this point. You're not making any changes. You're going to see what ha what happens now. And okay, uh, what about you know we were, Dr. T was meeting with superintendents and you know we we're talking about putting a part time person on some of these campuses. What's mm -hmm. the status of that? That's a conversation that we kind of reserved for this fall. We wanted to get the we wanted to get the high school partnership started first. When we started when we started talking to superintendents and principals about that, it was at the end of their academic year last year, and and when May hit, it is kind of is difficult to have that kind of a budgeting conversation with high schools. So that's definitely a conversation that's on schedule to initiate again this fall to try and, and see what, what kind of legs we can give that project. Definitely. But I I, I would echo that and say, <clears throat> just in last week. Uh, one particular superintendent is still super interested. They, there are several that are. And, you know, one of the things I said to him and, and kind of by design is, well, we have this additional dean starting soon, dean of student experience, which is really going to be focused on the enrollment piece. And I want to have that individual as part of that conversation as well. But I, I believe that that is a very important strategy as we move forward to be able to capture that cohort of students who I think at least it's been argued to me that we've missed that cohort that doesn't necessarily qualify for dual credit, um, plus additional students to be able to get them on pathways through Lewis and Clark. So that's definitely a strategy that will be front and center and uh, hopefully be able to implement uh, in the near future. So I just I still want it to be, yeah. you know, going yeah. to back burner. I just think it's no. very important. Yeah, yeah. That, that outreach has got so be. much time. Yeah. I just want to make sure it's all in the works right. and not a back a yeah. low priority. Right. And I don't think it is. And I would also point out that's that's over and above and in addition to what we're doing with our CEC staff and with our recruiting staff that are out in the high schools as much as they possibly can be at this point. Okay. Gary. Dr. Rowe. Good evening. Um, I think I'm going to have to announce again uh, the uh, increase in our state appropriation, which actually doubled our state appropriation. I'm so excited about it. I, I just can't let it go. So two meetings ago, I announced it. And, uh, Dr. Warner, at the last meeting, he referenced it. But uh, this is a really <laughs> unique opportunity for National Great Rivers and for the college uh, to allow us to become fully staffed, which we've been working on for 15 years and i think it's a unique, unique opportunity for us to be able to invest in some new initiatives and some new programs so <laughs> i'm really excited about that but in addition to that we've also had a lot of success with our land conservation program uh, that stewardship program uh, funded through nrcs uh, we just received an additional four hundred thousand uh, dollars for this next year to expand our landowner assistance and landowner conservation programs. So we're excited about that. And then uh, additionally, our Saborski Water School program, uh, we are the North American Water School for Saborski Crystal. And uh, that's in a holding pattern for the pandemic period. And we finally worked past that and have now signed off on the current grant uh, for the next three years for the uh, for the water school. So, and that's an internationally known program. It's one of eight programs worldwide. So we're feeling uh, that we're at the point here of really being able to uh, report on substantial progress in a variety of avenues for National Great Rivers. Uh, and so we're excited about that. And we're looking forward to this next year. Uh, questions? And I promise I won't report on it again next time. I'll <laughs> Three times, I'm going to let it go. <laughs> All right. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate it. Debbie. Good evening. Thanks for having me back. Um, last time I was here, it was June, and I detailed for all of you um, some highlights of the foundation's past year and 
Tonight, I'm happy to talk to you about what we're looking forward to and looking ahead toward. Um, the first thing that we're looking forward to is um, the foundation has partnered with the horticulture staff of the college to offer our um, donors and our champions uh, a fun experience um, with the summer garden show, Here Comes the Sun. So all of you should have received an invitation in your inbox recently, inviting you to that event, which will be August August 19th, it's a Thursday from 5 to 8 p.m. And it starts in the Grove and we'll be outdoors. So we'll be able to socially distance and be maskless if you choose to. Um, and we'll enjoy some special cocktails like a grasshopper and um, a fun program um, that includes Dr. Traska and our horticulture team and some of our donors who have supported the Monticello Sculpture Gardens for many, many years. So I hope that you all can join us. Um, our, the foundation's next board meeting is Wednesday, August 18th, uh, next week, next Wednesday. And the agenda includes a review of our investment portfolio, um, which will likely be fun because <laughs> the market has done so well. Um, approval of our FY22 budget, final budget, and a review of the college's strategic plan by Dr. Traska, um, as well as reports from members of the college's leadership team. Um, so similar to the reports that you are all hearing tonight. Our board members certainly appreciate appreciate our leadership team for taking the time um, to share those updates with them. Um, our strategic planning committee of the foundation is very much looking forward to working with um, college leadership and President Traska on aligning the, the foundation's goals in its strategic plan to the college's key directions. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to reporting to you on the results of that um, in the future. Um, I'm very eager to see our students back on campus in the fall, very, very eager, especially those who have received scholarships for the 2021-2022 academic year. Um, it's the best time of the year when we get to award scholarships, but the second best time of the year when we get to meet those students like Sam face to face and celebrate the success with them. Um, as well as with the donors to our scholarship program, like Dwight Wirtz, who has a scholarship in his parents' memory. Um, we hope to have our annual Scholars and Donors Dinner in October, and that's an event where our um, scholarship recipients and their families are invited to a banquet, and our donors are invited as well. They're seated together, and it is... Um, a deep immersion in our mission to empower people. It's a very meaningful event, but we'll keep an eye on how things are going with regard to COVID-19 and uh, make a decision in the near future whether or not we'll have to postpone that. So I will keep you posted. Um, it was a pleasure to schedule some visits with alumni for Dr. Traska recently. He went to Arizona and you may already know that um, there were a, a few alumni that I was able to find and reach out to, um, and uh, it's always interesting to make those cold calls um, to someone who hasn't thought about Lewis and Clark for a few decades and say, well, the president of our college would like to visit with you if you're free, um, and we had some takers, so I'm sure President Trasco will fill you in on more details of those visits, but we hope to do a lot more of those, not only locally, but um, when President Trask travels, take advantage of where he's going and find our alumni there and make some connections. Um, <clears throat> when the new Dean of Student Experiences is in place, and we hope that will be very, very soon, um, they'll be invited to join the college's scholarship mover team. I mentioned this the last time that I reported to you. We, uh, many of us on campus believe that our scholarship program is underutilized as a tool for improving enrollment and retention and would like to see um, see that change. So um, there's a rather large scholarship mover team 
and we have been putting our heads together around who our students are, when they are making their decisions, which means they need access to a scholarship, not just to apply for one, but to know if they'll be receiving one. So um, I look forward to kind of ironing out those details and reporting back to you on um, what changes will, will come for our scholarship program. And then later, hopefully reporting to you on how it improved enrollment and retention. The foundation's fiscal year ended June 30th, just like the college's, and our audit is underway, just like yours. Um, it will be presented to the Foundation Board of Directors at their next meeting in December. Um, the Foundation Board of Directors meets three times a year, April, August, and December, just so you know. Um, and lastly, I was asked for a few data points about our relationship with the Monticello College Foundation. Um, and then, uh, Annually, the college, Lewis and Clark uh, Community College, awards five to seven deserving women scholarships. And this comes from a grant from the Monticello College Foundation that is written um, under the leadership of uh, Dr. Lang, comes out of her office. So that grant is actually awarded to the college. Um, also, annually, about seven of the college's athletes who are women receive scholarships. I think that number's right, Dr. Hill. Um, and that is a grant that Dr. Hill leads around writing and submitting and then receiving if they, if they um, uh, grant our request. Um, annually, two women gain real experience in environmental science careers through INGRIC internships. Um, and that is a grant that's written under Dr. Rolf's guidance um, and also when awarded flows through the college. Through grants to the Lewis and Clark Community College Foundation from the Monticello College Foundation over the years, um, up to four women each year receive partial or full scholarships. Um, and these are scholarships that, uh, that uh, the, the grant from the Monticello College Foundation flows through the Lewis and Clark Community College Foundation and is restricted to um, the following, the Linda K. Nevlin Scholarship for the Humanities, the Carol A. Kemsky Scholarship for Women, the T.S. Chapman Scholarship, and the Monticello College Foundation and Alumni Endowed Scholarship. So in all, that's um, a pretty big impact on about 20 of our students who are women each and every year. Um, through grants to both the college and the foundation totaling um, more than $65,000. So I hope that helps a little perspective on our, our relationship with the foundation. Are there any questions for me? Thank you. I, I have one. Um, you mentioned uh, something, an event coming on in uh, August, was it August 18th Ninth, or 19th? Is August that, 19th. Is that the out, outdoor garden show? Is it that, is. Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't, I didn't, haven't received anything on that yet. I uh, wonder if it might went to my spam file or something. I went to your spam folder? Well, I will resend it. You got it? Okay. I will resend it to you, and I'll double check that I have the correct email address yeah, for and you. I'll, and I'll check my What's spam that? file. Mm -hmm. hey, I had one other uh, uh, question, I guess. I'm not sure you'd really be able to answer this exactly, but I'm wondering if you, if, Generally speaking, would like every high school in our district have at least one scholarship winner? And that and would that be announced at like the graduation ceremonies? I'm going to say yes to that. And here's why. Um, we uh, so some of the scholarships that the foundation awards are, are called um, distinguished scholar awards, and others are called golden eagle scholar awards. And the Distinguished Scholar Awards, there's 10 of them each year, and they are awarded to a traditional student, so a student graduating from high school um, the previous spring, starting at Lewis and Clark in the fall, and were um, to qualify for that scholarship, they have to be in the top 10% of their class. The Golden Eagle Scholarship is for the same uh, type of student who is in the top um, 11 to 20% of their class. And we have 10 of those as well. So we end up having um, qualified applicants from most of the, what are there, 18 high schools in our district. Um, but 
students do have to submit an application in order to be considered for a scholarship. And that's one of the things that the scholarship mover team is talking about a lot, is how do we increase the number of scholarship applications we receive every year? Because we have a student body of what, five, 6,000, and we only receive 300 applications every year. So we think that's you know, re really where we need to focus is on um, marketing and promoting those scholarship opportunities. Um, but in order to market to an audience, we need to know the audience, right? So we have a lot of discovery to do um, around who is applying and who isn't applying and why. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So I'm last and, and perhaps by design the, the one person in, you know, in between us going home. So a couple of things. I, I first of all want to thank the leadership team and everyone for just the tremendous work that they're doing uh, as we move forward. And so I think we all are really anxious for a great year ahead. And I know it's uh, perhaps going to be challenging, but uh, we have a great team, great support team around us and uh, just look forward to doing some great work together. So thank you. A couple of things, and I'll start, I guess, with, with Debbie's comments on the alumni visits, and, and th th those were very delightful. Um, I had an opportunity to meet with uh, a gentleman by the name of Keith Filoni, Fil 1976 alum, uh, bought a t-shirt here in the mid-90s, and so we have to send him a new t-shirt. Uh, great gentleman, uh, lived out in Phoenix for his entire career, still out there. Uh, Barb James, uh, Monticello College alumni, 1946. Um, and boy, oh boy, did she have some wonderful stories. Um, used to be an airport right across the street here. Uh, she used to sneak over there and take uh, aviation lessons, uh, met her husband, uh, and then they moved out to Arizona. Um, and then I had a chance to meet with Manny Jackson. And uh, that was uh, the initial reason for being out there to speak with him about the discussions we're having around the center, um, the vision that we're looking forward to exploring. And uh, he was nothing but supportive. And I apologize for that. Uh, and, um, and look forward to continuing good discussions there. And as I think Debbie said, continuing to build an alumni engagement philosophy and strategy that allows us to bring attention back to us and really remind everyone who may have forgotten about us. I mean, I've met with alum over the years that have forgotten they went to the college because they've gone on to a university and those universities are pretty aggressive in engaging alum. Um, and it's more so reminding them of the experience that they had here and uh, the impact that we've had on their lives and also giving an opportunity to us to keep them tuned into all the great work that we've done and thanking them for being part of our story. I think that really is at the core of it. And uh, so had a great time and uh, look forward to continuing to do that work and appreciate Debbie and her team's efforts in helping coordinate those. Um, also had a point here on the CBE piece and a little bit of building off of Brett's comments. You know, I, I have to extend a great gratitude again to the team and Dr. Lane and her team and Travis and everyone and even Melissa for kind of being next on sort of the schedule here of exploring competency based education. But I'll double down on, on, on the idea that I really feel that the strategy of investing in CBE, uh, continuing to invest in innovative models like that, BlendFlex, and then looking at even down the road layering these, these, uh, these access points will really be an opportunity for us to change the game of how students access education at Lewis and Clark. And then being able to build those support systems around it is going to be really important. And of course, the role that superintendents in our neighboring schools play in helping feed into those models is going to be very important as well. So just can't thank the team enough for really, you know, taking the seeds that were planted in the fall and turning it into an HLC approval, which I think is uh, pretty awesome. And to Jill's point, we are the only college in the state. I mean, they had to create some approval processes because of us and let's keep doing that folks, right? Let's make, you know, the government create processes for Lewis and Clark, right? <laughs> um, a couple other things. Uh, um, one of the pieces I'll bring to the board uh, probably in the next month or so, and I've talked to uh, everyone about this is, perhaps starting um, in the fall, and maybe I'll talk to Sam about this as well, is a board student dinner, an opportunity for our students um, at random to come together by invitation 
um, kind of spread across programs to provide us feedback on their experience at Lewis and Clark. And then to be able to create an actionable um, sort of list of things that we can respond to to better improve the student experience. Something I've done in the past that was uh, a really, a really important part of us keeping our finger on the pulse of what's happening um, across our campus and hearing it from the students. So that's something that I think is, is uh, important uh, that we continue to explore and, and perhaps in September bring a, an idea forward formally and maybe try the first dinner sometime this fall and then maybe one in the spring. Um, you know, I did mention in uh, one of the items, the action items, organizational restructure, we, we do have 14 searches still going on. Um, and so I think in September, there will be um, several more names coming forward. And as we continue to move forward, I know we do have a leadership retreat coming up August 24th. And we're going to be hearing from Gary Rolfe on some of the work and vision that he's setting up based on some of the new funding. And uh, we're also going to be continuing some discussion. We've kind of put it off a little bit as we get through the fall, but really looking at strengthening our athletic model and uh, at the same time by doing that helping support enrollment strategy and growth for the institution as well. Um, but just want to thank, I, I, I want to say, and I'm, I feel like I'm sort of making this number up, but I heard this number. It's about 130 or so team members who have participated on searches across the campus. And I know there's a similar number and maybe mixing these up. I think you gave this to me last time, Sue, 100, somewhere in the upper mid hundreds of mover teams, uh, uh, participants. Uh, we have, I think, close to 40 teams. And we'll be starting in a, a express mover team. I had this comment down for, which is a 30 day team. And we're going to design uh, our remote work policy and bring that to the board um, by October for you to consider. So there's a lot of uh, activity on campus and by design, it is to invite everyone to the table to give everyone an opportunity to help shape the future of this institution. And I'm just proud of those individuals who are stepping in and stepping up and for the leaders of those teams. And I, and I, I put this out here in a deliberate way. I challenge those team members who have yet to jump in on a team to jump in. And uh, you know, it's, it's, Going to be part of my message next week to the team, which is participate, be involved, uh, be part of the change that you want to see. And um, I think that's only going to make us better because everybody brings such a unique perspective and frame of reference that we need. So um, really excited about the work that's been done and even more excited about what's to come. Um, so I think I will, I will conclude there. I think I made it around my sort of scribbles here and just leave it if there's any questions, comments, anything I can entertain before um, I pass it back over to the chairman of the board. No, excellent, so thank you. This concludes our agenda. If there is not any opposition to adjourn, we are adjourned, thank you. Thank you everyone.